Last time, the Second Battle of Kurland raged, despite the weather bogging everything down. But now, the muddy season was over, and the Red Army was preparing to give it another go. Will the Soviets be able to break through the German lines? Will the Germans have the strength to stop them? And will Madman Hitler allow the evacuation of Kurland? Let's find out. At the beginning of November 1944, Schoener created a special formation under Latvian General Corellis. The idea was for him to infiltrate behind enemy lines and disrupt Soviet communications. At the same time, rumours went around saying that the Latvian 19th SS Division was going to be transferred back to Germany. The 15th Latvian Division had already been evacuated, and this also suggests that the Germans were planning to evacuate more of Army Group North than they did. But either way, as a result of the rumours, many Latvians started deserting into the forests. Schoener had to reassure the Latvians that they wouldn't be shipped to Germany, and that they would stay and fight on Latvian soil. The morale crisis passed, and some deserters returned. But because of the desertions, Corelli's unit grew in size, reaching 3,000 men strong from its initial 595. It was soon realised, at least according to the Germans, that many of the soldiers were deserters trying to get away from the front. So, despite it only being raised shortly before, the Germans now saw it as a threat. Chief of Police in Kurland, SS Obergruppenführer Friedrich Jecken, asked Corellis to stop accepting deserters. When Corellis refused, German troops surrounded his headquarters and put an end to his unit. After the Corelliisi were destroyed, Jekyllin created another commando unit. This was the Wildcats, or Meza Khaki. This was a specially selected, tightly controlled counter-insurgency group trained in Germany by the legendary SS commando officer Otto Skorzeny, which began operations in late 1944. The Rubenis Battalion was another group of Latvian soldiers who turned to partisan warfare, fighting to the death against the National Socialists between the 14th of November and the 9th of December. Rubenis was killed by Jekyllin's security forces, and the survivors went into hiding. Zlekas is a village between Kuldiga and Ventspils. In revenge for the Rubenis' battalion's crimes, between the 8th and 9th of December 1944, 160 people were murdered by the Germans. From a baby and three-year-old to teenagers and 80-year-olds, all were slaughtered. After ending the resistance of the Rubenis battalion, the Nazi police chief, Jekyllin, told his men to go into that area of the forest, round up everyone they could find who may have helped them, and kill them. So yes, 160 people were slaughtered. Meanwhile, on the front line, some of the German units were in a sorry state by this point. For example, on the 28th of November 1944, the 32nd Infantry Division reported that its 4th Infantry Regiment had just 80 combat troops in its 1st Battalion, and 40 in its 2nd Battalion. And that was its best regiment. The 94th Infantry Regiment had just one battalion, 1st Battalion, with 90 men, and the 96th Infantry Regiment also had just one battalion, also its first, with 105 men. The troops were exhausted. The main combat line consisted mostly of holes in the ground filled with melted snow water. There were many dysentery patients during these weeks. 
On the 30th of November, Army Group North reported its losses for the period, first to the 30th of November 1944. 33,181 officers and men killed, wounded or missing. On the 1st of December, there were still a total of 505,546 German soldiers, airmen, naval troops, SS and police in Kurland. That's quite a lot of troops trapped in the pockets. Worse, now that December had arrived, the weather deteriorated. The mud season passed by mid-December when frost gripped the landscape. Not only did this allow vehicles to move along the roads again, but also for some combat to be waged. The Soviets conducted reconnaissance missions during this period, and the Germans managed to repulse all of them. At the port city of the Apaya, Kurland's most important port, the Germans busied themselves with stockpiling equipment and building fortifications. This was despite the fact that somewhere in the region of 250,000 refugees had flooded into the Apaya during 1944. Some organisations helped them get apartments with the locals, people slept on the floors and on the tables, or even in the streets, in their carts, or with their horses. They were waiting for boats to take them away. With Soviet victory inevitable, from mid-1944 to the spring of 1945, many Latvians preferred to take their chances at sea than face a second occupation by the USSR. Politicians, writers, musicians, anyone who could play a part in a Latvian resistance abroad, set out in crowded motorboats and fishing boats for Gotland and then neutral Sweden. Around 4,500 Latvians made it to safety, although no one's sure how many actually attempted the journey. And according to Hunt, by late 1944, only a few fishermen were willing to risk their lives for the refugees. But even then, they would only do so if paid in gold. They wouldn't accept paper currency. Now, some may say that these fishermen were heartless and greedy, that they should have accepted the paper currency of the day, and that they were just trying to profit from the situation. But is this really the case? During an economic, political or military crisis, fiat monetary systems collapse. Paper currency is just that, paper. And paper has no value. The only reason currency is worth something is because people think it is. And they think it is because the government says it is. But the National Socialists were printing currency, known more recently as quantitative easing, in order to fund the war. In 1939, the number of Reichsmarks in circulation had been 12.2 billion. By 1944 to 45, it was somewhere in the region of 40 billion. That's a 228% increase in the number of banknotes in circulation. And yes, this is an inflation rate of roughly 23%. If you'd had 10,000 Reichsmarks in 1939, by 1945, those same 10,000 Reichsmarks would only be worth 2,084 Reichsmarks. You would have lost 7,916 Reichsmarks worth of wealth simply by having this money sat in the bank. And you would have needed to increase the amount of money in your bank to 34,628 Reichsmarks just to have the same amount of purchasing power as the 10,000 you had had in 1939. This is because... The more currency in circulation, the more that the government or the central banks print paper, the less that currency is worth. But it's even worse during a regime change. The National Socialist regime was about to be replaced by a Marxist Socialist regime. The old Nazi paper currency isn't going to be backed by the new Marxist government, so it was about to lose all of its value. 
It would be pointless for the fishermen to risk their lives shipping refugees to safety for paper that would be worthless in a few months' time. So, they wanted gold. Real money. Gold would still be valuable after the regime change, and it has nothing to do with profits or greed. Gold is money. Paper is not. So, the evacuation of Kurland continued. According to Hunt, by the end of the war, 350,000 soldiers and up to 900 civilians were evacuated to Germany or German-occupied Denmark from Kurland. Again, this idea that Army Group North wasn't allowed to withdraw is disingenuous because they were withdrawing. They didn't withdraw all 500,000 plus men in one go, but they did withdraw. So the question we need to ask is, could they have actually withdrawn all of the troops in Kurland? By this point, the Soviet Air Force had unlimited superiority in the air. 54th Fighter Group, nor the 6th Air Defense Division, were able to stem the tide. Despite the Green Hearts claiming 293 enemy planes destroyed in the first two battles of Kurland. The Soviets bombed the German positions, roads, railways, and harbors constantly. They also attacked the fleeing boats from both the air and the sea. The Kriegsmarine was busy both supplying and evacuating troops from Kurland and would soon, from January, start evacuating East Prussia as well. If the Germans were struggling to evacuate Army Group North now, they would certainly struggle after that colossal task began. So, it appears that there's a time limit on Army Group North's withdrawal. But it's hard to deny the fact that the Germans were already evacuating Kurland at this time. The next confrontation in Kurland would be the Christmas Battles, where countrymen fought countrymen, brother fought brother, and the pain inflicted on Latvians by this conflict struck even deeper at the heart of the nation. The Third Battle of Kurland began at 0720 hours on the 21st of December 1944. It was minus 15 degrees Celsius. Soviet artillery barrages fired and bombers flew, smashing up the German positions. 1st and 38th Army Corps were hit hard by over 170,000 shells. 205th, 215th and 225th Infantry Divisions and the 563rd Volksgrenadier Division were pummeled. Then, at 0830 hours, 3rd and 4th Shock, 10th Guards, and 42nd Armies attacked. Once again, the aim was to reach Liepaja, but also Saldus. In fact, the Soviets concentrated their main effort at Pampali, a small village southwest of Saldus. They were trying to capture the saldus liepaja railway line and split German forces in the Kurland pocket in two. By 10am, 38th Army Corps had lost contact with the 225th Infantry Division. The 329th Infantry Division was hit by a heavy tank attack. Tank and infantry forces also caused 205th Infantry Division to collapse. 225th Infantry Division was penetrated, and Wagner's 132nd Infantry Division was penetrated as well. These were forced back, with Wagner's men retreating to the Pampali area. 215th Infantry Division struggled to hold on, and Frankowitz's command post ended up becoming part of the front line, in the thick of the fighting. 12th Panzer Division and the 227th Infantry Division were sent into the Saldus area to stem the tide. 
but their counter-attack was unsuccessful, and 12th Panzer Division's Panzer Grenadier regiments were reduced significantly in strength. Brandner's 912th Sturmgeschutz Brigade was also sent in, and found itself defending against numerous T-34s and Stalin tanks. One battalion from his brigade supposedly took out 37 T-34s alone this day. There's some evidence that during this fight, the Germans were running short of ammunition. Again, suggesting that the Kriegsmarine was not able to fully supply Army Group North. Further German reinforcements did arrive though. The 11th Infantry Division moved into the gap between the battered 132nd and 225th Infantry Divisions in an effort to stabilise the situation. 12th Panzer Division closed the gap between the 215th and 290th Infantry Divisions during the night. On the 22nd, further Soviet artillery and airstrikes hit the Germans, and 4th Shock Army assaulted the German line on both sides of Pampali with 9 divisions. The main thrust against the 16th Army was directed against the 205th Infantry Division in the Zvande area under General Lieutenant von Melithin. That division alone had to deal with three Russian infantry divisions. But again, the Red Army divisions are smaller than their German counterparts, so yes, they were outnumbered by about a third or so, but not by the 3 to 1 ratio that Kurowski implies. 4th Panzer Division, now temporarily under the command of Oberst Christen, as Betzel was on leave in Germany, was ordered to counterattack the Soviets to the east of 225th Infantry Division's area. Christen had his doubts about the attack, and sought to amend the plans, but was compelled to do as 1st Army Corps had ordered. This is interesting, because usually Hitler is blamed for not listening to his junior commanders, and yet, here we have an example of another German general not listening to his junior commanders as well. But, either way, Christen's concerns were justified. Mud and congested roads slowed the movement of the division to their starting point. Conflicting orders and strict radio silence added to the confusion. Due to the cold, minus 15 degrees Celsius, and the bad terrain, enemy fighter bombers, and the poor logistics and poor reliability of the German tanks, 75% of the Panzer IVs, 40% of the Panthers, and 50% of the Tigers didn't make it to the area. The much reduced camp group from 4th Panzer Division, with just 20 Panthers, 10 Tigers, and 2 Panzer Grenadier Companies, counterattacked anyway, and quickly ran into an ambush by Soviet anti-tank guns. The attack stalled, and, of course, Kurowski blames the failure of this attack on the unfavourable terrain and the weather. Isn't it strange that every time the Germans fail, it's not because the Red Army resisted or anything, but because of Madman Hitler and the weather. Buttar, on the other hand, makes it clear that it was a combination of factors that resulted in a dismal display by 4th Panzer Division, including Christern's leadership and the lack of Betzel at this crucial time. When speaking about 4th Panzer Division the next day, Three Panzer IVs and ten Panthers were in service. Twenty-six Panzer IVs and twenty-three Panthers were in the maintenance facilities. This clearly demonstrated that the 4th Panzer Division was no longer capable of conducting a decisive attack, no matter how great its fighting spirit might have been. Masses of enemy armour could not be stopped by dedication to duty, fighting spirit and aggressiveness. Okay, for starters, tanks don't have to take on tanks. That's not the only way to destroy tanks. Secondly, 
did it not occur to you, Kurowski, to ask why there were so many tanks in the maintenance facilities in the first place? It might be because they'd been taken out by the Soviets previously, or because of the logistical issues that Army Group North was facing. This is evidence that the Kriegsmarine was struggling to supply the Kurlin pocket, and that the Germans had the tanks but couldn't supply or repair them. But this implication that the Kriegsmarine was stretched thin, or that German logistics was poor, seems to have been missed by many of the authors. On the 23rd of December, the Germans had managed to stabilise the front, although 4th Panzer Division's performance was poor once again, and was reduced from 30 to just 13 tanks. This was perhaps why it saw itself subordinated to the 225th Infantry Division. Yet, despite the stabilised situation, the Soviet attacks continued. 22nd Army attacked 6th SS Corps north of Dabella and pushed towards Dzutska. South of the area between Lestena and Dzutska, two divisions of Latvians from the 130th Rifleman Corps fought the Latvian Legion's 106th Grenadier Regiment. Yes, in the Christmas battles of 1944, Latvian faced Latvian across the battlefield, fighting in the uniforms of the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. I've mentioned this previously, but I think it's worth stating again. Despite the claims of the German authors like Kurowski, the Latvian SS were not volunteers. And we know that the Soviets also forced the Latvians to fight for them as well. So this fight between the Latvian SS and the Latvian Red Army units was actually a fight between forcefully recruited conscripts thrown against each other in the name of foreign powers and ideologies. That said, the fighting was no doubt very bitter. In spite of the efforts of the Latvian 19th SS Division, the Germans were pushed back three kilometers, with a portion of them being surrounded and having to break out. They did manage to stop the Soviets east of Dzutska though, and at some point the 106th Grenadier Regiment was hit by artillery and tanks and lost 60% of their men. But despite this, the Battle of Rumbas, which is no longer on the map, would continue until the 31st of December, with Latvians spilling blood on both sides. On the 24th of December, the Soviets continued their assaults. The Latvian 19th SS Division was forced back 8 kilometers, but at 1700 hours, the fighting stopped. Christmas Eve 1944 brought peace. The war caught its breath for a few hours. Merry Christmas, everybody. Bearing in mind that this video will be released on Monday the 17th of June 2019, so almost as far from Christmas as you can make it, but Merry Christmas nonetheless. Now, kids, I know it looks like the Pope sent good boy Hitler extra gifts of two Santa Clauses this year, but... The way we explain this as historians is, um, uh, ask your parents, and I'm sure they'll be able to tell you why this is the case. Yeah. Dear Tick, my son's just asked me why Hitler got two Santa Clauses off the Pope, and I couldn't explain it, so I'm unsubscribing from your channel. Much hate, Fat Herman from Idiotville, Oregon. Both sides spent Christmas Day opening their presents. The Soviets gave the Germans a nice artillery bombardment, followed up by a concentrated attack in the Dzutska area. The Germans gave the Red Army stiff resistance in return, holding on with the 227th and 81st Infantry and 12th Luftwaffe Divisions. 19th SS Division, though, was overrun, so 16th Army sent in their reserves. 6th Guards Army was also keen to give the Germans their presence, striking towards Leopaya from the southeast. 
Isn't Christmas such a wonderful time? Well, it's over, and the battle continued on the 26th of December. The 22nd Soviet Guards Division had a special combat mission on this day. They attacked the 205th Infantry Division. The first wave of the attacking infantrymen wore German uniforms! Exclamation mark. Therefore, the outposts were deceived. The anti-tankers were, however, at their posts. They destroyed 18 of the following combat vehicles. Kurowski contradicts Hapt by saying that the Germans were only deceived by the uniforms for a few seconds because they knew that only Russians could come from the Russian lines. Which of these accounts you should believe is entirely up to you. Army Group North also reported destroying 111 tanks on the 26th. This seems excessively high, considering that the Germans claim to have destroyed 166 tanks in all of November. Unless they are saying that they destroyed 111 tanks since the beginning of December, which would make much more sense. On the 27th or 28th of December, the sources contradict, the Soviet 5th and 19th tank corps broke through at Dzutska, advancing two kilometers. The HQs of 19th SS Division and 227th Infantry Divisions fought bitterly to defend themselves. The 24th Luftwaffe Light Infantry Regiment, under its excellent commander, Colonel Kretschmar, stood like a rock in the surf. The Luftwaffe soldiers gave no ground without exacting a price. Colonel Kretschmar died a soldier's death with his weapon in his hand. Note that this quote is interesting for a few reasons. Not only does it divert the reader away from the fact that the German line had broken and had been forced back, not only does it refer to the German units as rocks drowning in a sea of Red Army riflemen, not only does it speak of the heroism of a glorious German officer who gave his life valiantly for the cause, but it also praises Luftwaffe ground troops. Yeah, Luftwaffe ground troops. You know, those often criticised poorly trained formations, which were seen as a drain on resources that could have been better spent elsewhere. Honestly, I think this is the first time I've ever seen anyone praise the wonderful and glorious Luftwaffe ground troops. You know, well done, Hapt. Um, well done. Um, you've excelled yourself here. And there's people out there criticizing me because I pick on Hapt. Go on then, defend these three sentences. Explain to me how Hapt doesn't have a pro German or pro Nazi agenda. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing once more you rally to his defense. Anyway, then on the 29th of December, the Latvian 19th Division counterattacked and retook the lost ground. On the Soviet side, the Latvian 308th Rifle Division penetrated 93rd Infantry Division's lines. 4th Panzer Division, moving from the west to the area west of Dzutska, reinforced 93rd Infantry Division sector and plugged the gap. Betzel was now in charge again, and with his leadership, 4th Panzer pushed the Latvians back to their original positions. 12th Panzer Division also plugged gaps in the lines as well, and after a few more days of fighting, the offensive ground to a halt on the 31st of December. The Third Battle of Kurland, the Christmas Battles, had finally ended. The number of Soviet casualties is not mentioned in the sources I have, but Hapt does say that Army Group North reportedly destroyed 79 Soviet guns, 267 machine guns, and shot down 145 aircraft. But do you want to know how many tanks the Germans claimed to have taken out? Are you sitting down? Ready? 513. 
Yes, on the 26th, they'd supposedly destroyed up to 111 tanks, and within five more days, another 402. That's more tanks than the Soviets lost at the Battle of Prokhorovka. Now, obviously this is the German estimate, and in my experience, all sides always exaggerate their estimated kills, simply because it's impossible to know if a shot destroyed the tank, or just knocked it out temporarily, or scared the crew who then bailed out but later recovered the vehicle, or just immobilized it, etc. So I'm going to err on the side of caution and suggest that this number was probably less than that. Um, but even so, we're still talking somewhere in the region of 400 Soviet tanks being taken out by the Germans during the Third Battle for Kurland. The Germans reported on the 31st of December that the 16th Army had lost 15,237 men, and 18th Army lost 11,907 men, either killed, wounded, or missing. That's a total of 27,134 casualties for Army Group North. Of course, some units suffered more than others. For example, 215th Infantry Division alone took over 600 casualties during the fighting. After the Third Battle of Kurland, Army Group North reported that it had been reduced to 407,000 men, and of this, 375,000 were frontline soldiers, 20,000 were Luftwaffe troops, and 12,000 Waffen SS and police. This was down from the 505,546 they'd had on the 1st of December 1944. So basically, around 71,000 troops had been evacuated in December from the Kurland pocket. And then on top of this, you have civilians and National Socialist governors being evacuated as well. The good news was that the number of civilians needing evacuating had been reduced to just 10,000 at this point, and there were 10,000 Soviet prisoners of war in Kurland too. So I think it's obvious that they had been evacuating the rear services and civilians first, before evacuating the frontline troops, although some of them had been evacuated as well. Clearly, the Kriegsmarine was having its work cut out for it, and this notion that they should have evacuated Kurland needs to be revised, because they were evacuating it. They were evacuating it a lot. The main issue seems to be that it's not easy evacuating 500,000 people all in one go. So the question is, was the Kriegsmarine actually capable of evacuating this many people? The army group stays where it is. I am expecting a change in the situation soon. Then we will deal with Kurland. Hapt and the others are keen to present the Kurland pocket as being purely Hitler's fault. Hapt states that Guderian, chief of the general staff of the OKH, was unable to persuade Hitler against holding onto Kurland. And yet, in the same breath, Hapt then says that Guderian did succeed in allowing some units to move back to the Reich, including the 83rd Infantry Division. So, they weren't allowed to evacuate Kurland, and yet they were evacuating Kurland. Contradiction much? Right? The evidence is clear that they were allowed to evacuate Kurland, and the logical explanation for Hitler's refusal to evacuate all in one go is that they couldn't actually do it physically. Also, that quote from Hitler I am expecting a change in the situation soon, then we will deal with Kurland. Sounds like he's saying the current situation is preventing us from either evacuating or freeing Kurland, not that it should remain there indefinitely. Again, there's a lot wrong with this idea that Kurland should have been evacuated and that madman Hitler is entirely to blame for it. There's more to this than meets the eye, and maybe. We'll find out soon who's to blame. 
Thanks for watching. Bye for now.